Welcome to Tribeca Ball 2021. We are so thrilled to throw open our virtual doors and welcome you into the New York Academy of Art. Tribeca Ball is truly one of the most exciting nights on the city's social calendar. It's not just a party, it's a party with a purpose. Normally at this time of year, you would all be flooding into the school to see the studios and to see the great work and the artists behind it. This year, although we can't get together in person, we're gonna do that exact same thing. We're going to bring you in so you can meet these up and coming young art stars and see them in the process of getting the education that you are supporting and helping to make possible here at the New York Academy of Art. This year marks the 10 year anniversary of our partnership with Van Cleef and Arpels on Tribeca Ball. Together, they helped us put on a show that was equivalent to the art being made in the studios. They created a magical environment that celebrated the gift and the craft and the talent of the handmade. They celebrated the education that we deliver here on a daily basis, together with you and your support. This year, we chose to honor an artist who has had a major impact on the New York Academy of Art, Eric Fischel. He's one of the leading figurative artists in the country, and he's one of the leading lights of the Academy. Tonight, we've got a great program with some wonderful special guests and a few surprises along the way. We're thrilled to have you with us. The New York Academy of Art was started in the early 80s by a group of artists and patrons, among them Andy Warhol, uh, who were worried that the classical skills and techniques of fine art making were no longer being taught in graduate schools or any art schools across the country. So they got together to create an alternative. And in a church basement, they created a free drawing class that focused on exactly those skills and techniques. From the church basement, we moved to rented space on Lafayette Street, and then we finally found our permanent home in 1993 on Franklin Street. From there, the Academy has stuck true to its mission. The school is very connected to the contemporary art world and fortunate to be in the global center of it here in New York City. It has grown into one of the leading graduate schools in the country, attracting students from all over the world, and every year producing some of the finest new artists to hit the scene. One of the great things about the New York Academy of Art, in contrast to other graduate schools, is how intensive the training is, how hands-on the teachers are, how involved the faculty is with the students. We're studying color, we're studying composition, we're studying perspective. We spend a lot of time studying anatomy and studying the connections, the flow, and the dynamic movement of the body. We're learning to see, but we're also learning to imagine. We want to know what went before us in order that we can create anew. This is a very uniquely supportive and close community. If you've ever been here, the minute you walk in and see the work and meet the students, you just want to be a part of it. I've heard from so many people, whether it's um, collectors or even board members, who step into this place and just feel that academy magic. And it's intoxicating, and it just makes you want to be involved. The academy education is so unique. There's nothing else like it anywhere. When a young artist comes to us, they're immediately taken up by a community of figurative artists and they're supported in their learning throughout the next two years. They get hours and hours of hands-on education and they get hours and hours of critical feedback on their work. Our goal is to support them in the growth and evolution of their artistic voice. So now, I want you to see some of that happening. Come with me into a class. I'm here with Heather Personette, who is the teacher of Sculpture 2, life-size sculpture. And Heather also happens to be an alumna of the Academy. She graduated in 2014. Heather, you were always kind of a breakout star when you were a student. What, what do you like about teaching? I, I feel that as I've continued um, with sculpting at the On School, sort of felt like my duty to gather all the information that I've learned and then try to impart that onto 
um, onto other sculptors who are trying to get mm -hmm. these skills. But I always consider that I can teach better when I know the information better, and that means that I have to investigate it myself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do make sure that I take time to work on my own work mm -hmm. in the interim. Hi, do you mind if I distract you for a minute? Oh, sure, no problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first, tell me your name. My name is uh, Jackie Doika. And Jackie, what year are you? I'm a first year. Why did you choose the Academy? Because the Academy focuses on the figure. Mm -hmm. I feel like undergrad, there's not a lot of time to really acquire all the technical skills. What's your major at the school? I'm in the painting program. Wow, you're in the painting program and here you are sculpting a life-size figure? Yeah. I thought that taking sculpture would help inform my painting practice mm -hmm. by helping me conceptualize the form mm -hmm. so that when I go to the canvas, like I have a good idea about what a figure is and how to build it. The Academy was started by a group of artists and patrons in the early 80s. Among those early supporters was Andy Warhol. In the early days, as a board member, he was bringing a lot of his friends down to the school, like Jean-Michel Basquiat, Kenny Scharf, Keith Haring, and telling them that they needed to study drawing here, too. Now we're going to hear from two people who were part of that early scene, Kenny Scharf and Brooke Shields. You're perfectly framed. What are you talking about? It's funny because look at mine. <laughs> you look gorgeous. When I was asked to do this, I was looking just back at the whole era of the 80s. And that was, I mean, that was such a vivid time in my sort of trajectory in my life and my career. And I, I, I was always just kind of wanted because I didn't, oh my God, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> That's crazy. I've cherished this session for time, many years. Huh? And then Keith wrote Richard Avedon in the back. So you still look the same. I was... and we're, we're all the same. We just <laughs> Thank you. go through more experiences. I mean, do you want to go to a nightclub? Never. Why do you want to go to a nightclub? ever again, right? It doesn't compare. And why do you think it was such an important time for such um, artistic creativity? Well, I mean, it was kind of the last generation before the internet uh, took over everything. And you had to be in person. You had to be in one particular place in order to make things happen. And any young aspiring artists looking at Brooke Shields portraits by Andy Warhol, right? You had one, right? Yeah. Of course. I did. So, you know, and, then, did. and then just be inspired to be in New York. And you were just like, I need to be there. So we all just arrived with our suitcase, you know, and our $500, whatever. And you could actually move down to a funky neighborhood, meet other artists. You could work in nightclubs. It was doable if you were. 20 years old and you had the energy. It just also seemed like such a, that, that there were fewer rules or that it was, everybody was celebrating their own individuality artistically at, in that period of time that everything was okay. Well, that's why we all moved to New York. So we could, as I say, or we say, let our freak flags fly. That's what yeah. New York said. The community that, welcomed me the most was the artistic community That's so because cool. the questions that I was asked were unique the perspective was unique I remember feeling a comfort a comfort with with you know Andy and and with Keith I was allowed to just be actually a real person I'm so happy to hear you say that I think that an artist understands an image is not the same as a person, it was always just a plus that we got to have you around and feel your actual sparkle in humanity, but to also know, oh my God, look at her. She made that, that image that we all, that is so adored, you know? I feel like your art in particular, your, your vision um, of what I remember um, seeing a playfulness and a joy and a 
power to it. So it was this juxtaposition of, of what I was even experiencing in my real life, you know, that there was, there was a gravitas to it, but also a playfulness to it. I was inspired by my friends, of course, my little circle, uh, as, as you know, Keith was a huge inspiration as a friend and, and Basquiat, everybody knows, you know, we were all like in competition, but also inspired by, and then a lot of different artists of my age. And then of course I looked up to Andy. He was our impetus for moving to New York. I think Andy kind of created a whole, a whole new idea of what artists can be. So he opened up a lot of doors for me and a lot of the artists I knew. You know, I've been um, a member of the, the New York Academy of Art, the, the family of it for a while. And it's been so beautiful to me to see, to watch the artists and how they evolve. What do you think about what is so important about what the sort of the mission of what the Academy is about? Well, what I always loved about the Academy when I, you know, in the early days when I used to go there with Andy, is that if you went to art school, you weren't really learning the techniques of how to paint. It was more like a conceptual and what do you need to paint for? Painting is dead, right? So what the school is doing is actually, we're talking about technique and old school ways. And then from there, you can just do whatever you want in the the, the technological world. But I think it's important that we hold on to what we're looking at and what we're touching is very human. And I, and I, you know, even back then I realized how waning it was. And now more than ever, I think with the technological world, we need even more humanity and the human touch, which is a big part of what you learn at the school. Oh, thank you. And thank you for being such a, a, a kind member of, of that whole world for me. See you post-COVID. I'm looking Absolutely. forward to Absolutely. Rebecca Ball has been instrumental in building the confidence of so many of our artists over the years. It's a night where, perhaps for the first time, they sell a piece of their work, or they meet somebody who takes a real interest in their career. They never know who they're gonna meet that night. I remember the year that we honored Micheline Thomas, Thelma Golden, the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, walked into a student's studio and said, wow, you're ready for a show already. Although we're not able to go into the studios in person tonight, you do have the opportunity to see all the work that is on display at TribecaBall.com, where you can both see and purchase that work. And now we're gonna hear from some of the alumni whose lives and careers have been so greatly impacted by Tribeca Ball. My time at the New York Academy of Art was one of the most influential experiences that I've ever had. My family has always taught me how to live life through my passion and the Academy gave me the tools uh, to do that. I was studying fine art in England at Oxford um, where the program was sort of very conceptual and quite hands-off and I was becoming frustrated because I just really wanted to learn some very basic things about how to improve my craft. So I decided to come to the Academy and after the first week I thought like oh my god I've learned more in a week here than I learned during like the previous two years of my degree. There's no other grad school I could have gone to to learn what I learned here. My main focus was those fine painting and drawing and sculpting techniques. I came from a place where I had to constantly defend myself for my passion, for what I was doing, um, for why I was painting in general, for um, why I was painting figuratively. And once I found the school, I found a place where that all was embraced. And that really allowed me to grow as an artist and um, as a human, actually. The thing that really stood out for me at the Academy was how much I learned, not just from the faculty, but also from my peers, my colleagues. This place attracts such a high caliber of students that any time I wanted to learn something, as well as turning to a teacher, I could turn to my classmates. Well, even though they're from different countries and cultures and places from around the United States, I still feel like there's this commonality of this work ethic amongst the students here. Tribeca Ball as a student is terrifying. 
Um, but it's also exhilarating. It's like, oh my god, there are celebrities in the school now. You feel like a real artist, you know, you have people coming by looking at your work in a very serious way. A lot of the time painting will feel like such a private, internal, personal process and Tribeca Ball is a chance to share that process with other people. Tribeca Ball also gave me a chance as a student to develop business practices and just learn how to communicate with people about your work. It was at my first Tribeca Ball where I sold my first painting ever. So I had like all my comic graphic novel work up and I met this uh, publisher who wanted to work with me. I was incredibly humbled by the amount of attention I got and the amount of sales that I was able to do, but most importantly the connections that I was able to make. In one night I basically sold artwork, uh, had a glass of champagne, and got to meet Meryl Streep and Julianne Moore. I graduated school with a wait list of people who actually wanted my work, and for an artist at my stage that just feels so amazing. I love supporting the artists. I love getting to know the artists. I don't think I've ever gone home from a pro Becca ball without something. Every year at Tribeca Ball, we honor an artist who embodies the values, the spirit, and the ideals of the New York Academy of Art. But it's rare that we have an opportunity to honor somebody who has had such a long association with the school. This year, we are particularly happy to honor Eric Fischel. Eric is smart, caring, funny, and enormously talented. I have only one criticism of Eric Fischel. He's perfect. Other than that, he's perfect. He's an incredible artist, he's an incredible thinker, and he has had an enormous impact on the New York Academy of Art. The list of good things that Eric has done for the school is long. He has curated shows, he's taught classes, he gives lectures. When he does group critiques, the entire school comes to watch. You never know what he's gonna say. With Eric, when he gives critiques, it's very relaxed but very direct. He'll quickly just mention something like, the feet look like boxes, like work on the, your feet, or uh, the rest looks good, but you know, the, the feet stand out to me, which is a critique I got, I was like, oh God. I had always really liked Eric's work, so I sort of saw him at like an art opening, um, and I went up to him and I was like, oh, Eric, I love you. And he had this look that he was like, I know I should resist like giving more of my time to students, but I just can't resist it. Um, so Eric came by my studio um, very generously and he like sat down and he just really looked at each painting. He was like, look, you know, most of your work, it's really kind of terrible, but I think you have something to you. And these are all the things that I think you can work on to make your art interesting. He's willing to take you absolutely seriously as an artist. And that's just so incredible to have that kind of interest from someone who is at that level in their career in the mid 80s, a brilliant young painter uh, had a one person show at the Whitney Museum and kind of showed the world single-handedly that painting was important. Soon after that, um, I wrote Eric a fan letter asking if he would ever consider coming to speak to the students at the New York Academy of Art. In a letter which I've kept, it's from 1991. And he says, yes, he'd like to come and do something with the students about figuration and narration. But the most important thing he said was, let's see if we can contemporize all that incredible facility. He became the guiding spirit uh, that really helped the school develop in, in so many interesting ways. Eric, more than any other artist that we have in our community, you're somebody who everybody looks to, everybody looks up to, and um, you've had a profound impact on our students and on our, our artistic life there by your example and, and also by your involvement. Um, tell me how you first got involved with the school. I, uh, well, thank you for the compliments as well, but... Uh, That's the last one, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the rest is going to be brutal. <laughs> I was uh, invited by Eileen Guggenheim to go talk to students. I, I knew very little about the school other than a negative reputation, which was that it was, as its name implied, an academy. It was, uh, you know, sort of totally retro 
conservative, conservative, uh, you know, figurative painting, and uh, and it was such an anachronism in the art world of the '80s in New York mm -hmm. that I found it hard to say no. Mm -hmm. it, it was more like, how, what is the, this phenomena? And I was never trained as a, uh, academically trained. I had no technique, no uh, sort of historical uh, foundation, etc. So I was curious whether it would have been better for me had I had that. I certainly, uh, to my delight, found that a lot of my peers were completely curious about what the hell's going on over there. And so they were, you know, they would come and, and talk and, and uh, do lectures and stuff and, you know, bring, uh, uh, you know, their sort of fresh blood to it. So, uh, you know, I, I think over time it became clear, of course this is going to happen. It should happen, right? You, you were amazing at making it happen. Thank so. you. So at the time you first got to know the school, as you said, it was kind of an academic backwater. What was it about the school that made you stick with it? To, to walk into any other art school, university, etc., e even today, you have to make an argument for painting. You then have to make an argument for figurative painting. Then you have to make an argument for contemporary, contemporary then narrative, then, you know, whatever. You have to, you, you can't start by just talking, right, about the thing you love to talk about, right? That's exhausting. And, uh, and so one of the things with the academy was I didn't have to start at that ground zero because of the the visitors, the, the, you know, the visiting critics, the lecturers, the, the, you know, the different kinds of stimulus that were being introduced into it. You started to get students who had the ambition. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted to make work that spoke to the moment and, and you know, participate in, the, in that. And that, that, the, the more that happened, of course, the more I wanted to continue to be a part of that and promote it and, and you know, help where I could. When you, you, you're famous at the school for doing these group critiques and you, you come in and you just start talking generally mm -hmm. about art and life and philosophy and all kinds of things and then you bring it into the individual pieces. What, what are you aiming for in those critiques? Uh, ba basically, I'm bullshitting until I find something I can actually talk <laughs> Fake about. Fake it until you make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In more serious terms, you, you know, trying to lay out a field that's, that is present and problematic uh, or compelling or whatever it is that, that has to do with, you know, why paint? Why be an artist? Why, you know, what, it, what does that actually mean? What, what are you bringing to the experience of our lives now? That, that, that higher purpose. I think the most important thing that I do in looking at individual works is show them that painting is a language and that anyone who speaks the language knows what they're doing and also knows what they're not doing. You know, painters, young students need to understand that. Everything that you put in a painting can come out of that painting. What advice would you give to an art student at the academy who wants to, you know, be taken seriously and make it in the art world? I would identify your peer group and I would identify what it is within this peer group that is the generational conversation. That is the, you know, they talk about zeitgeist and things like that. What is the zeitgeist? How can you contribute to the articulation of that zeitgeist? Because that's your job as an artist, is to articulate in the clearest form possible what it's like to be alive now, right?
One of the things that I think is so beautiful about the art world is at its best it is an infinitely expanding universe. Mm -hmm. There's always new, you know, it's additive. There's always new voices coming in and they're only making the whole thing richer. Yeah, I always find that uh, teaching, there's a point at which I have to decide whether I'm going to let this person live or kill them <laughs> because they're too good. <laughs> So, so far, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, have you seen a few people like that at the school? Absolutely, yeah. There's some real talent there. There has been some real talent there. There's also people there that surprised me in that I wouldn't have picked them yeah. to, to a, a grow and blossom as they yeah. did once they got out of yeah. uh, school. So, Isn't that amazing? I, I really agree with that. I love walking around the studios at this school and you just never know when you're going to turn a corner and just out of the blue see something, you know, amazing from somebody who is just fluoresced, yeah. you know, and just come into their own suddenly. Yeah. And you can't pick it out and you can't tell when it's going to happen and it makes every trip around those studios an adventure. Yeah. Eric, a lot of people um, wouldn't take the time on young artists that you're willing to give. Why are you willing to invest so much time at the school? Part of it came out of my um, experience at a junior college, at Phoenix Junior College. I had a lot of help from some really amazing people that were there in terms of exposing me to a bigger world of art and stuff like that. It just seemed like a, a natural thing to, to give back. I, I think uh, for young artists, the, the most important experience is to see that there's a place that you belong. So one of the things we work really hard to do is to spread the word about the work the Academy is doing. And I have to say, nobody's been a more important messenger of that than you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. One thing I learned about being an artist is that luck favors the prepared. Don't worry about any of the extraneous stuff, especially politics in the field that you want to get into. It's good to show your face, make everyone know you're, you're there, but don't think about it, especially don't think about it when you're creating. So your number one mission is to make the best work possible and to bring out everything you have inside yourself. Don't allow yourself to be negated. I've jumped from medium to medium my whole life, and it's usually because the doors have been slammed in my face. So I go to a different door or I try a different medium. Find any way that you can within your reach to be creative. Try to support new galleries, support your friends that are showing, those networks, those connections that you make, um, you can build off those connections and those will grow over time. And now a word from two of our chairs who happen to be great friends of Eric's, Steve Martin and Scott Avitt. Can you see it all right? It's a, it's a Picasso. It's a Picasso and Einstein. <laughs> okay, that's so Eric. It's interesting to me how fast Eric and I became, for, I mean, fast friends. I, you know, I, I read his memoir. So did I. It, it, that was what prompted me. I knew of his work. I think I was just naturally connected to it in my uh, sensibility as an artist. But uh, when I read his book, I connected to him as a human, you know, directly. And when I reached out to him, he said, come to my studio. And that was it. It was just, you know, on from there. So I feel so close to Eric, but we've only known each other since 2015. Well, I've known him a long time. I can't remember how we met. I know it was through art. It was probably at an opening. And I, I have a vague recollection of going to uh, his studio downtown. And I had, I had, had, a, had an admiration for Eric's work. And, um, and I think uh, Brian Hunt was there too, the sculptor. And I looked at Eric and I looked at Brian and I thought, wow, these guys are handsome. <laughs> I didn't, so you're talented and handsome?
And then uh, I met <laughs> April, you know, a, a, his, his wife. And I thought, wait, yeah. wait, wait. This comes as a package? God, I, I, re- I think I remember I invited them to um, a St. Bart's for a weekend. I didn't really know them that well. And that's where we really <laughs> became friends. Uh, you know, playing anagrams and uh, games and talking about art. And my, my greatest thing was to walk with April and Eric, you know, on the beach and just pick his and her brain to talk about art and get his feeling. And I, I really learned a lot. I even wrote about some of the conversations uh, I had with Eric. Everybody I, I speak to that knows Eric uh, has something to say about how fascinating it is to listen to him talk about art I mean, I, i'd also would also have evenings like with myself april eric marty short some really interesting people and as the evening went on i would think wait a minute this guy's funnier than me and marty <laughs> <laughs> he's he's a lot of things he's he's an intellect and he's a comedian and he's a surf bum and he's a <laughs> he's a brilliant art. I mean, he's a lot of things. I had written a play and I wanted to do a poster for the play. And it was a, the play was about Picasso and Einstein. So I, I got the nerve up to say, Eric, do you think you could do a, you know, a one sheet image for this play? And he said, what's it about? I said, Picasso and Einstein. So he got out his watercolors and he, I, I, this is the way I remember it. The more I think about, it, no, that's impossible. But he dipped his brush in a color, and he dabbed it on the paper, did a squirrel, and then lifted it up, and there was the face of Picasso. Well, he said, "You mean like this?" Boom. You know, it's like if you asked a guitarist, you know, can you play something by Segovia, and you say, "You mean like this?" I know it's hard to see on this, but this is Einstein and Picasso. Einstein is, for some reason, sitting on the shoulders of Picasso, and they're both looking at a nude. And <laughs> Einstein is playing the violin. And, uh, you know, that's sort of, you see the image of Picasso. I have, uh, I have painted all, the, ever since I uh, uh, went to art school, I've maintained a studio. When I met Eric and his, his explanations and his encouragement to me, for the professional that he is, I needed that elder advice and that elder uh, validity that he gave me. And uh, it sort of broke down a wall that I was uh, kind of stuck behind. When uh, I would visit Eric, um, him and I traded pieces one time and he made a nice little draw. He probably made this in uh, 30 seconds, uh, based on what you said. <laughs> but uh, I mean, talk about academic, you know? I mean, that is so academic and uh, beautiful. Uh, it's like there's a precision and then there's never fussy. There, there's a non-fussy yeah. precision yeah. that he made, that he rides this line and it blows me away. His, his later work is uh, rivaling his early, you know, work where he made a splash. And he's been okay. so consistently great uh, through the years in the face of changing times. Um, and yet his work just uh, stands up as well as anything. I think that's what he teaches young artists, period. We need, we need examples of people that work, live to work, work to live and do it to the day they die. And Eric, he lives to create. And that, that encourages, I know for me, in, in whatever the medium is you do, that encourages me and helps me. You know, I, I remember an art dealer I knew in the, in the 70s. He dealt in 19th century paintings, which are all figurative and, you know, that sort of thing. And he said, a student today has no place to go. Where would you go to learn how to draw a bird feather? Well, you're, you're bridging into the conversation about the academy right there because it, the academy is 100% uh, 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 a beacon or a guidepost for, for that, that mentality. You know, uh, you co- to compare it to music, if I'm not called to create a song, to turn to the, the traditions of the banjo or a guitar or the piano, they're always there. They're always there for us to, to dip back into. It's good to have that uh, backup to say, oh, yeah, you, you, you think you could do that? Yeah, see if you can do this. But, you know, another thing about Eric is ever since I've known him, he's been uh, showing me and been enthusiastic about 
new artists, younger artists. And he says, look, look at this work, you know, look at this. And if you go to April in his house, they have a lot of um, uh, younger artists on the wall. Yeah, hundred percent. His, his joy and his, the love that he uh, radiates him and April both is uh, that's, that's what it's all about. If you ask me. Uh, so Scott and I wanted to do a little uh, musical collaboration and we came up with a little number. Uh, I played it on the banjo. And I sang it from my mouth. Good place to sing from. We chose a song that we're, uh, we're hoping will be uh, singing to you in person. It's called, I'll Be Seeing You. I'll be seeing you In all the old familiar places That this heart of mine embraces all day through in that small cafe the park across the way the children's carousel the chestnut tree and the wishing well I'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day In everything that's light and gay I'll always think of you that way I'll find you in the morning sun And when the night is new I'll be looking at the moon But I'll be seeing you Normally, if you showed up at the school on the first Monday of April, you would see a line wrapped around the block of people waiting to come in. When you got into the lobby, it would be filled with a crowd and flashing bulbs and fashion stars, art stars, uptown, downtown. You never know what you're gonna see or who you're gonna run into. And as you left the lobby and took the elevator up into the studios, you would enter a magical world transformed from a normal everyday art school into an incredible fantasy land by Van Cleef and Arpels. Van Cleef and Arpels has turned the Tribeca Ball into one of the must-see, must-attend highlights of the New York social and artistic calendar. Van Cleef and Arpels, they do an amazing job at repainting and redecorating the school. It becomes like a wonderland. I think we close the school down for about two or three days just to get ready. You go from a normal school that's got a lobby, some studios and some classrooms, and then all of a sudden it's just poof, transformed. There are themed rooms. They had stilt walkers. On the fifth floor, we had like these constellations. Live models who were reenacting classical paintings. There was like a swing uh, from the ceiling and everything. It's just visually spectacular. Van Cleef and Arpels creates things that are handcrafted, beautiful, rare. There is definitely a Van Cleef and Arpels style. Very figurative, very much inspired by the representation of nature by literary and poetic sources, by the idea of uh, imaginary worlds and fantasy. We believe at Van Cleef and Arpels that the artistic dimension, that the creative dimension, keeping alive the tradition of figurative and traditional drawing is key. And that's obviously something uh, that the New York Academy of Art fights for, defends and promotes. We share artistic and aesthetic values and I think that's why we've been so comfortable working together for over 10 years now. There's something in my role that really struck me about you know, 20 years ago when I started working at uh, Van Cleef & Arpel is that it felt almost sometimes that you had to choose between tradition and modernity. And I don't believe in that. I believe there is a continuity and there is a need to associate tradition and modernity. I think this is a unique component of education at the New York Academy of Art uh, and this is the reason why we work so well together. My, my advice to young artists is to find someone uh, of similar 
thought and talk about the subject you're interested in and keep talking and keep talking. And I don't mean for hours, I mean for days, for weeks, for months, something going to come out of that that is going to be unique to you. Once that calling is established uh, to create and to make the world more beautiful, I think following the uh, the calling to be to be ourselves, I trust that all the success will, will fall in suit right behind that. When COVID-19 first hit last March, and we realized the severity of the situation, like everybody else, we had to close down. But we were determined to get back into our studios and classrooms. And starting in August, we opened back up. Everything was live again. We changed the building to accommodate the special needs. We made sure everyone had a safe and secure individual studio and followed certain protocols. But we have met the challenge of educating our students during this pandemic. So now let me take you into a drawing class being taught by our faculty chair, Michael Grimaldi. Michael, I just always get so um, envious when I come in and see all these beautiful drawings. It makes me wish I was in your class. So Michael, obviously we're all yeah. dealing with uh, the issues of teaching live in the pandemic. Um, how has this class changed since uh, the advent of COVID? Well, I, I was teaching this class uh, last semester when, when uh, the lockdowns and quarantines started happening. So we ended up switching everything to online for a little while. But it was a huge relief when the academy uh, decided that, you know, while maintaining social distancing and all of that kind of stuff, to bring back the, the live aspects of, of the class because it's critical that we're kind of looking at a three-dimensional experience, a model that's, uh, that's living, breathing, and moving, and not just a projection on a Zoom screen to get a three-dimensional understanding of a, of a form. Tell us about drawing as a, as a foundation for the school. Okay, so drawing, is required by all the students regardless of what their concentration is um, and so with anatomical drawing it's really a way of having a, a profound understanding of the cause and effect of what certain shapes are that one sees so that we're not just copying nature but actually uh, looking at form able to kind of anticipate movement i noticed when i was walking around the room looking at these drawings each one of them is beautiful in its own particular way. Yeah. And it's very apparent that there is a voice there. Yeah. For centuries, drawing was kind of looked at as a secondary, like a, a preliminary, a training mm -hmm. exercise or preliminary for something else. But we've, we've seen with a lot of our graduates from mm -hmm. here, uh, making, developing phenomenal careers exclusively with, within the language of drawing. Hey there, what's your name? I'm Pedro Troncoso. And are you a drawing major? I'm a painting major. Uh -huh. but I love to draw and uh -huh. try to build things based on knowledge and conceptualization mm -hmm. rather than just superficially. Yeah. So I think that's my favorite part. Right there. So in other words, to, to render it accurately, you need to know more about what makes it up? Exactly. It's like working from the, from the back to the, to the front. Yeah, or from the inside to the outside. Exactly. And, and it's great because it's like working mentally and then you, you, you put it on the paper and, and then that's physical. Hi there. Hi. Do you mind if I distract you for a minute from no, your drawing? No, no. Um, can I start by asking you your name? My name is Riam Ilsadani. I'm originally from Egypt uh -huh. and I moved to the States four years ago. And how did you find out about this school? All the amazing artists that I saw uh, on Facebook, on social media, connected to each other and they all graduated from, from this academy. And how, how has it been for you? Uh, you've had one semester now and you're starting your second. How has it been? Honestly, honestly David, it's a, a, a dream coming true. Tell me, what's the hardest part of making a drawing like this? At the beginning, before I come, it was impossible for me just to sit and see this. I would just panic because I don't know where to start. But with our professors, actually, and it's just one semester, I don't feel anything is, is hard. It just takes time and devotion and extra time mm -hmm. to put it in, but they, they made it so easy for us to see. Eric Fischel's uh, powerful paintings and his remarkable career speak for themselves. But what's truly inspiring to me uh, 
In addition, as April and Eric's tireless commitment to serving other people. Well, congratulations, Eric. I don't know if I ever officially thanked you for the When the Worlds Collide 1984 painting that was purchased by you, through you, for the Whitney Museum, and for an artist to do that for another artist is something that is really major. And so thank you and congratulations, you deserve it. Hey, Eric, it's Ark here. Just wanted to say hi and say congratulations. When I was graduating, um, I had applied to a few things like fellowships and like residencies and stuff. You know, I ended up not getting any of them. And I remember talking to you about it. You know, basically at the end of it, you end up telling me that um, a lot of these things sort of end up postponing or putting off you know, what you end ultimately have to do anyway, which is sort of figuring out how to be an artist, figuring out how to, you know, maintain a studio practice. And, um, you know, that conversation really sort of gave me some confidence to sort of do that. When I was a student uh, making figurative art in the 80s, Eric was my role model. He's the artist who made that seem possible at a time when figurative art wasn't generally being discussed. Um, my dream back then, was to show with Eric at Mary Boone Gallery and to get to know him on a personal level. And that took another 12 years, but that's what happened. The Academy is so lucky to have been the recipient of Eric's generosity over the years. Thanks, Eric. Congratulations, Eric. Uh, I will never forget our first beautiful, real time that we got to connect when we, um, I went over to your studio and we had a, a very, very beautiful conversation about art and, and acting and, and that spurred this whole arena for me to play different characters. And you turned it into something very beautiful. And I thank you for trusting me with that. And I thank you for allowing me to be um, a part of the whole process. I hope you've enjoyed the show we put together for you tonight. And we thank you for your support. I think we can all agree that the arts are more essential now than ever. Thank you to Van Cleef and Arpels, who has made this night possible for the last 10 years. Thank you to Eric Fischel for bringing your inspiration to the Academy for 30 years. And thank you to our chairs, Nicholas Boss, Steve Martin, and Ann Springfield, and Scott and Sarah Avitt. We couldn't have done it without you. And thank you to our benefit committee for carrying us across the finish line this year. And thank you to all our friends watching tonight who support the Academy throughout the year. We cannot wait to welcome you back in person. Thank you so much for your support of the Academy. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting the New York Academy of Art. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. It really makes a difference. One, two, three. Thank, Thank you for your, for your support. Oh, we're delayed. We're delayed. Oh. Thank you so much for your support to the New York Academy of Art. Scott. Thank you so much for your support of the New York Academy of Art.